not only on my own behalf, but actually on behalf of a team, which has formed rather recently, which is composed besides myself, of three scholars. indicated by this, uh, this lettering, uh, and actually the lettering itself is uh, interesting from various points of view. The, the choice, let's say, in modern India, if one recites the alphabet, one would start with A, A, E, uh, etc., and one, one would not start uh, in the way the alphabet is displayed here. Uh, so from the history of the alphabet and how it was used, uh, there is something interesting in this particular series of letters was not yet uh, well, I'll come to speak in a minute about the inventory of uh, inscriptions of Jamba. This set of uh, which, uh, in which I would consider inscriptions of letter, they are not a very uh, normal type of inscription uh, was not considered to be an inscription up to now at least uh, hasn't figured into the AFU's inventory uh, of Jamba inscriptions yet and uh, this is perhaps one of the biggest uh, inscriptions of Jamba, so moving from uh, metal objects now to <coughs> perhaps more standard uh, surface, namely stone. stone. Uh, you find uh, normally freestanding pieces of stone, but also uh, a number of rock walls have been inscribed, and this is one of several square meters, uh, which hasn't been published yet, and uh, what we hope to return to the field in and get uh, documentation for this inscription as well to decipher it. Um, the Champa corpus is, is rather smaller than uh, the number of inscriptions in Cambodia and Indonesia, but uh, it's remarkable in these two ways that it uh, contains the oldest inscription of Southeast Asia, the famous Volkani inscription in the 
Besides containing the prize in the oldest inscription of Southeast Asia, to Ur, the Jabak Opus is also important for even the oldest document in the Austronesian language, so older than the oldest old Japanese or oldest old inscription. This is the oldest old German inscription, as I should say that besides Sanskrit.
advantages, which um, our friendship is because we're also very uh, lustrous at collecting. Um, and these are two types, namely inked and uninked. I'll talk about that in a minute. And there are two, actually three principal uh, places where they have been collected. I don't know why the third is not mentioned since so that's the Société Asiatique, which also receives normally the people in uh, Anam, the colonial officers, and three copies of every rubbing or assemblage uh, to Paris. One of them ended up in the National Library, and one of them in the FEO. Actually, no, that was not in Paris, it was in Hanoi at that time. Uh, so two got into Paris and one got into Hanoi. So almost they're done. listed there and then they're yeah. So that's a very handy tool which we have for uh, a total of 200 jump inscriptions. Um, and um, the funny or sad thing about uh, this field of studies is that this first list was published in 1923. And I think there were about 160 entries then. There were two supplements published in 1937 and 1942. And since then, not a single thing uh, has been added. Whereas, as we found in the field uh, last fall, uh, there are like, dozens of inscriptions that can be added to this list. So our main purpose is to add to this list, and of course to correct, because with the war and, and whatever, uh, several items, actually fewer than I had uh, expected, but uh, several items have moved places, have disappeared, of course. Um, so our main aim is to uh, continue So, uh, when we return to the field in May, actually our main task will be to collect estimated sandwiches of all the newly discovered inscriptions. Now, one of these new discoveries is a fantastic, unique uh, stella uh, dated to CE, which I had the honor of publishing just a few years ago. Um, it's in Sanskrit, and it's important for historical reasons, but uh, also it's Or 
ornamentations. It's a really uh, unique type of calligraphy and, uh, and well, certainly Jamba calligraphy, but actually I don't know any other examples which are as developed as this one the photo offers. Um, I don't know any other examples uh, from the mainland or from Indonesia. In India, for example, in Palaka calligraphy, there are a few examples, uh, but none of them are really exactly. So, uh, just to give a quick picture, uh, this is something that's changing rapidly as I'm uh, meeting people who uh, have more competence or expertise in, in let's say, the technolo technological side of this kind of research. Uh, what I started out doing is simply typing into simple text files all of the published uh, inscriptions. Uh, so, you just give a little database, and then you have a little search program. Ha cave, and there are sort of two bits, there are two Jamba inscriptions which mention the word cave, and then it actually gives them, it's quite handy this program because you can click on it and it immediately opens the files and can paste it into an article that you already um, So this is our starting point, and then, well, as we discovered in the inscriptions, we add to this, and then we have to develop this into an online presentation with the photographs and whatever, and maps. And This the inventory, so another thing I did was basically just typing uh, that inventory that I just showed into the spreadsheet.
back is fully prepared for receiving the inscription, but after uh, yeah. engraving the usual uh, Namashivaya, yeah. uh, the, the engraver didn't do his job. Um, and as far as I remember, this particular piece was uh, received by the museum as we got by customs. I'm not sure whether there's, I mean, there might be some reason to suspect the authenticity of this, of this piece, and also to explain the fact that there is no, nothing, no actual content to the inscription. Um, I find these elements, the standard elements, are very easy for a copy to you know, it's meant to be to just copy from, uh, from models, but then how do you really want to write something in old town? Supposedly, all the time or whatever, or Sanskrit, uh, and more difficult. So, if, if we consider this a fake, some uh, new discoveries which really will add a substantial amount of text to the rather small um, small amount of, of preserved full, sort of full sized texts from the Champa. To me, it was quite surprising that in the Soviet Union, in 1953, Shankar corresponds to the beginning of the 11th century of our era. Uh, to me, it was quite surprising that they had come to There were, was a kind of Muslims there at that time. Uh, and not only that, they tried to give evidence of their presence uh, using uh, old time language and uh, India derived script. There are, in fact, a few. 
back to that moment to that other small description. It is actually not such a thing. Still presuming that it's a game, which requires quite some stamina to reach. Uh, say three hours uh, up into the hills on the coast there and then into the province. And uh, you need a guide. I didn't have a guide, so do we need the room? Um, and in that cave, oh, this is actually a view uh, on the way back from the Talan and Haya. And um, the road is quite a bit easier than to go to the other road, which is through the bushes. Um, anyhow, some views up there in the cave. And this is the actual description, also some other published book piece. Most reading is like this. This was the absolute the masterpiece uh, of our discoveries last fall. Actually, it's a kind of sister to uh, that earlier step, uh, the step out of 705, so not earlier, actually, slightly later, step out but earlier published, earlier discovered, still out that I referred to just now. Um, it's uh, extraordinarily well preserved, essential uh, description. Um, it doesn't, unfortunately, show these nice. Aspects that made that other description so spectacular. It was issued by the same King Satya Varma, for whom we now have several inscriptions. Until a few years ago, there was just one, uh, one inscription in the history, uh, but now we have three. Um, I think there was uh, some interesting things to say. In fact, the conference, the conference in Berlin next fall, I would say some more about this Satya Varma. Um, this inscription has two faces. Sky, sky, mountain, that is, uh, on the fifth 
Lunar Day of the Right for the Night. Uh, there's something going wrong with the Herods here. Uh, yes. On the fifth lunar day of the bright fortnight of Vaishaka, being a civil day starting at night, endowed with auspicious conjunction of lunar day, Karana, Mugurta, these are all astrological elements, lunar mansion, weekday, horoscope, etc., was devotedly erected on a plot, eminently auspicious due to the performance of proper worship. The illustrious Adi Deve Shaka, so that's the name of the god being erected here, whose statue, or god presumably, whose linga is being inaugurated. An embodiment of Shiva's eight forms, that is, earth, water, fire, wind, ether, initiate, moon, and sun, whose pair of lotus feet was bowed down to by throngs of all kings of God, all kinds of, that's a type of, of gods and demons. And he was erected together with the Lady Shri Durga Devi, whose lotus feet were worshipped by throngs of various nymphs, who gives fortune to all people who are devoted to you. That's a great mystery, 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 you. Um, so, from a historical point of view, we learn here that there was a direction of presumably Linga uh, of a god called Adi Deveshwara, so manifestation of Shiva, together with uh, presumably a statue of Durga. Um, and, well, this, those are, I think, most things for the moment, because where was this? right inside the temple compound of Alai, uh, which is still yeah, actually has been restored recently in a rather extreme manner. Um, but at the moment there are only two there. Originally there were three towers, uh, only two, the southern and northern of which uh, are still standing. The central one, uh, which is where this inscription Actually, the inscription was found close to the central one, but between the central one and the northern one. Um, so, presumably, we have here the foundation inscription of this temple complex. And the temple complex was previously dated uh, to the 8th century or not early 9th century by French scholars on the basis of statistic uh, arguments. So, here we have uh, hard evidence now, for, uh, which confirms more or less. It makes it possible to, uh, to fix it in the 8th century, the foundation of this. Uh, um, another little interesting detail in, in this inscription is the fact that it gives the oldest uh, reference to the term Anduranga, which is uh, presumably the Sanskritized version. If we presume that the term Panaram, which uh, figured already in one of the inscriptions, and and the same Manduranga, uh, it's also from uh, Chinese sources, uh, figures down here. I think this is by far the oldest, uh, which mentions this toponym. Uh, but uh, um, so, I don't know whether this means that uh, if we presume that Pandaram is the original, that Pandaram was uh, the Sanskritization of it, uh, whether Pandaranga is, it, let's say, uh, a step closer to the, to, to the original, not having the U, I, I think actually it's just a case of describing it. Um, now, moving back to ritual objects, I started showing you um, the sensor bearing uh, inscription of RC 206 when we were in, uh, which had this little handle, uh, which apparently a colleague of mine told me that there are actually in, in Indonesia there are um, sensors of comparable type, bronze, uh, and apparently in Japan there are also sensors which have more or less the same uh, shape with this uh, long, long distance handle. Now this is a rather different type, which we might not uh, have identified as a sensor were it not for the fact that in this case there's an old tongue inscription which contains a word which itself uh, is, was not known from other inscriptions, uh, but which there are good reasons which I perhaps do not to explain here, but there are good reasons to uh, translate it as sensor. Uh, so we have here another uh, inscription which is friendly enough to self-identify Object. This is actually an interesting difference between uh, term ritual objects and uh, there's a small group 
subscription which apparently entered the collection of the History Museum in Ho Chi Minh City maybe five years ago or so. We met the collector, the same collector who also previously owned that uh, silver sensor that I showed at the beginning, um, who now doesn't have it anymore. He said he had passed it to the Ethnology Museum in Hanoi, uh, but my colleagues at the AFU, when I asked them to contact the museum in Hanoi, indeed, uh, my museum has some objects, but not silver, and not inscribed. So it seems that this silver object might be lost. But this one is there, essentially, City and there's an inscription which I still find quite uh, hard to. I mean, there are lots, many cases, all the time it's hard to deal with because there are elements which specifically don't know what they mean. Uh, but this, at least the uh, end part is clear, so some kind of prince, uh, Sri Devaraja, offered this sensor to the goddess Parameshwari Rupa in the era of the Shanta King in 2053. This goddess Parameshwari Rupa might be. Famous goddess Bonagari uh, of Nacham. Uh, there's at least there's the only reason why I say that is that there's one inscription from Nacham which refers to her as Parameshwari, uh, but it's her general name. So uh, I know it's a bit of this, but if, if so, then this would give us an idea of the provenance of the object which is known as uh, Yes, yeah, so this word Asan. Now coming, I think, to my last example. Uh, um, an inscription previously known, a registered number, the number C64, and recorded to be uh, spread over three different locations, uh, well, maybe two different locations in the inventories. According to the inventory, one portion was then, that's in 1923, kept in Danang. Still there, cemented to the wall. In fact, another project that we hope to engage in in the coming years, if funding comes through, um, is a new presentation of the inscriptions in the Danak Museum. And one of the main uh, first tasks will be to remove, remove these inscriptions from their cement uh, casing. Um, so, this uh, fragment is. Then two other fragments were supposed to be in situ at the temple site of Tiendang, which is in Guangnam province, central Vietnam. Uh, and indeed the main portion can be still found there, but the third portion we weren't able to find. Now there is a site, uh, maybe not a museum, but there is a kind of shed on site, which we didn't get permission to enter into. But according to uh, the government official who uh, accompanied us, uh, you know, so a third fragment might be lost, but um, yeah, this is one of the many reasons why the FU has, well, might be a little bit uh, about itself, uh, the 
Texan was interesting for me to find here the first case of the word Aniaga in Old Chum, the graphene. Those who know Malay will know the word uh, Niaga, uh, and it's like Banyaga, uh, Banyaga, etc. So this is actually from the Sanskrit. Uh, Anijaka, uh, very old, probably three tunnel, uh, long word into Southeast Asian languages, which exists in Old Japanese and Old Malay. Um, so I think it reveals something about the networks of trade and the fact, uh, I don't know whether we mean the fact that there's an Indian word being used for that, uh, means a whole lot about the involvement of people in the universe and, and trade several centuries later, but uh, uh, well, at the very least, it's an interesting, uh, interesting little detail for those like me who are interested in linguistics. Sorry, I'm not an expert of epigraphy, but um, uh, I do read some. Some of the uh, letters are completely unidentifiable. So how did the Sanskrit, Devanagari script, uh, transform into the charm Sanskrit? No, no, I'm talking about the inscription. Ah, ah, you mean uh, the actual? Yeah, the actual uh, letters, yeah, the script. Do you know the normal script? Mm -hmm. Are they, yes, I can read them. with the Avagraha on the first line. Uh, this is actually Ta. Ta. Uh, but if you would go to uh, Alava inscriptions of the same period, so 8th century, you, if you are able to read them, you are able to read this. So this is Tamil script? Oh, well, not that. No, 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 no. Derived from uh, South India derived. Uh, derived from Tamil. Yeah, but uh, no, no, not from Tamil, it's a from writing in South India, but not necessarily used for Tamil language, uh, used for Sanskrit language, but also used for Telugu language. Uh, so, I mean, in all of South India, let's say until all the 9th, 10th century, uh, scripts were used at limits. Uh, I mean, that resembled each other a lot, and they were used for different languages. And by the same token, anybody who can read in you know, Indian inscriptions from the 8th century can also read them. So, Southeast Asia uh, until yeah, the end of the first millennium, the scripts 